It's time for Cutting Edge Consciousness with Freeman Michaels and Barnett Bain. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here with my guest co-host, Mark Waldman. We are talking today to Dr. Andy Newberg, uh, a, a neuroscientist and uh, a, a co-author with Mark of several books. And before we went to break, we were talking a little bit um, about, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about capacity. Um, and, and by that, I mean that w what I want to talk about is, is the savant syndrome where there's uh, and, and the, one of the most famous examples, of course, is the movie Rain Man, which is based on some actual savants and, and certain uh, abilities they have, abilities to photographic memory, where they can memorize incredible amounts of data. The toothpick thing, where the toothpicks fall on the ground, he immediately knows exactly how many toothpicks are there just by a glance. Those kinds of ways where we know there's a potential and I realize uh, for you neuroscientists, there are people studying this, and, 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 and again, it's one of those areas that people don't know exactly what's going on. But it often involves one part of the brain being either damaged or not working, in a, not being neurotypical. And then there's this island of genius. There's this other part that fires off in a way that is quite remarkable. So I want to talk about capacity and the idea that, there, that, that this, is a, this shows a lot about human potential. And so I wonder what's going on with our brains in terms of untapped potential. Can, can you speak to that, Andy? Uh, well, I guess, you know, um, uh, to some degree, uh, the answer is we don't know what the full ultimate capacity of the human brain is. I mean, when we see what some people are capable of doing and whether it's in mathematics or other types of tasks um, uh, or, you know, our, full, our emotions, um, our thought processes, our creativity, uh, all of that is, you know, as far as we know, is, is, is almost unlimited. I and mean, we don't even really know whether or not our brain is able to, you know, do some of those sort of sci-fi type of things and, and affect objects at a distance and, and, uh, and do all of that kind of stuff uh, to any great extent. So, um, you know, we, we don't know what we're capable of doing. And I guess that's the good news because we might be able to do far more than we ever dreamed we were able to do. And we create crazy, wild, creative experiments to see if we can find out to prove or disprove any of these things. We just don't know what the brain is capable of, and it looks like it does much more than we can even imagine. Yeah, I'm, I'm in love with anomalies, anomalies on top of anomalies, because, again, you know, where for one uh, sort of mode of thinking, this is highly problematic. But I, what I feel is changing in the world of science, and maybe you both can weigh in on this, is there was a period where th th I think there was a running away from anomalies in a desire to sort of know and control things. I mean, I think of the Human Genome Project, for example, the desire to know, like, okay, we'll map all the genes, then we'll know we'll control everything. And every time we as human beings think we're going to get it nailed down, we get anomaly on top of anomaly, and then we're off to I don't know again, which I think is a wonderful place to be personally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the problems, too, is, uh, you know, there, there's the inherent problem of science, which is that it doesn't handle anomalies very well. That's what I'm saying. Um, you know, it, it, it just doesn't. Uh, statistics, which is what, you know, is so widely used to help us evaluate our data and our information, it really works so much better when you're looking at populations and you're looking at groups. And, um, you know, just look, taking, taking, for example, music, which obviously ties in very nicely with creativity. Absolutely. Um, there's different ways of trying to understand what music is and how it works in human beings. And one way is to take a thousand people and 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 see you know what they're able to do musically and test them and and see what the norms are and 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 where where they are along the their various extremes and so forth. But you could also try to learn something about music by studying somebody like a Mozart, where you have such an extreme ability in music that you could really learn a lot about how music is processed and thought. But, but then you have other issues as to whether or not the way he processes or thinks about music is the same as, as the way just the, the average person thinks about music. And um, so, you know, there, there is this important, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right that it's so important for us to be able to really know what people are able to do in the extremes. Uh, but we also want to keep trying to tie that back to what the average person does and what they're able to do and, and see how they relate to each other. And it, it kind of goes back to our discussion in the, in the first segment about 
the balance, the balance between the extreme and, and the norm and seeing where those relationships are. And that's, that's part of what science is slowly coming around to, I think. And I think you're absolutely right, though. It's going to be very important going forward for but science then, to but be Andy, able to that's what you said about, address those questions. That's what you said about anomalies. The whole problem is, is that we're studying the average individual. You get a highly creative individual. They make everything go oddly off the scales, and then in science, you throw that person off the chart. So if you have an Einstein in your group, he's going to be eliminated because he's an anomaly. That was the problem that Richie Davidson had when he studied these highly advanced uh, Buddhist uh, meditators who could do extraordinary things with their brain. They could look at a, a picture that would cause disgust in absolutely every normal human being, and these people could generate a feeling of compassion and caring and warmth and it took him what seven years before he can get his article published because nobody wanted to believe that somebody could do something different with their brain than average well we may have stumbled on a much bigger issue which is the whole nature of the way we've organized information systemically as a culture mm -hmm. you know I, my brother is an academic and his wife is an academic they're both professors and you know, I know that they're always working very hard to protect themselves in that world. And I think, wow, you know, is it um, I'm over here pondering possibilities. And in a way, you know, that's dubious. It's it's intellectually dubious to, you know, wonder and wander and not know for too long. And that's a challenge uh, systemically, I think, of a lot of how academia is set up. I'm wondering if creativity and science are opposed to each other. That's interesting. Sure. I mean, there is in the way that we hold them today. That doesn't mean that that paradigm can't shift. Right. I mean, and that, that is kind of the classic notion, as you mentioned, of the paradigm shift as to what does it take and how much does it take. And, uh, you know, certainly there are plenty of examples in science where people came up with a new idea and they were rejected and ridiculed and run out of their institutions. You uh, bet. And then, and Come then, on, the world's yeah. flat, don't you know? Right. And then 10 years Darwin. later, they win the Nobel Prize. So, <laughs> That's it. Um, <laughs> so I think there's a quality here. It's interesting. This may tie things together, and I'm not trying to tie things together too tightly, but just the idea that there's a tremendous amount of courage involved in being willing to. And courage, of course, comes from the French word cur, which means heart. In other words, there's, there's an element of emotionality and risk. And of course, there's a lot of emotionality and risk in creativity. That re creativity, in my mind, always has this element of risk because there's always this I don't know aspect in, because I, I, I've been involved, I was an actor, you didn't know this, but for many years I was an actor, and a couple of times in my career, I stumbled upon genius. You know, I wandered into a role or a, a play or a situation where it had almost a life of its own. It was more than the sum of its parts, and we all, on some level, took a risk and gave ourselves to it in, in a way that took us on a ride that we could never have plotted. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that you're touching on, which I think is also an important element into, into this whole issue about creativity, is what is the role that our emotions play, and particularly our emotions of fear? Because on one hand, you to be fully creative, as you're saying, you, you need to kind of minimize your, your feelings of fear because you, you need to say, I, I think this is an amazing idea, and, this is some, and I've got to go out there and, and, and tout this idea. To the world. Uh, on the other hand, you have to have enough fear to to again make sure that you balance out that you don't go, you don't become crazy. Well, and I'll offer you something that's been talked about a lot on this show, and when Barnett and I talk about it, and 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 Barnett, if you don't know him, he's a, a very well known movie maker, probably best known for the Academy Award winning film What Dreams May Come, which is a little out there, <laughs> by right. the way. Um, and we talk about integrating the fear. That it isn't that we're actually getting over or, or no. pushing aside. It's utilizing it. Yeah, it's a way of noticing and being aware of it. It's the observation. It, it really is this contemplative, um, you know, th th those kinds of practices are very helpful for how we want to be with fear when it comes up. Right, and, and being able to utilize fear in a constructive yes. way versus a destructive way. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I said earlier, I think the real art of being creative and living in this world is to how do you balance going back and forth between being sane and insane, mm -hmm. between being ordinary and extraordinary, how to think within the box that the world has says this is the box you need to live in, and how do you step out of that box for brief periods of time. People who are very good in the artistic world who can do that, who can go out and go into the creative insanity of whatever the mind or the brain generates, and then can come back and work in a well-organized way, 
those are your most successful creative artists. The others, like Van Gogh, just lose themselves in the creativity and lose parts of their body. I I th I'm even going to language this. I think, it, it, for me, it's about honoring the tension. In other words, uh, similar to, to Andy, what you were saying, that we become aware of it and it's, it becomes constructive. In other words, we know what the tension is. We know what the risk is. It's a very conscious thing to say, I'm willing to risk, in this case, you know, going Not into something. honoring else. the tension, exercising the tension. Beautiful. Consciously yes. going back yes. and forth between normal reality, mm. extraordinary reality, mm. back and forth. Trips off the reservation. <laughs> Which obviously can happen in, in a in a in a meditation state. Well, I think that is what a meditation yeah. state is, and you know, sure. and, and Andy's been doing these brain scan studies for forever, and that's what you see. You see the brain functioning in ways that that you can that you can consciously change the way in which your brain is functioning. That doesn't make any sense. It could look like it's crazy. Nobody else can do some of the things that these advanced meditators can do. You agree, right. Andy? Yeah, absolutely, and and I mean, you know, again, as you were saying, I mean, our research is, is is able to show how some of the areas of our brain that are normally functioning when we are kind of in our usual state of reality, those are the areas of the brain in particular that are affected, uh, and oftentimes they go offline, so to speak, mm. uh, while the person engages in this practice where they can be be very crazy seeming, uh, but then once the practice is over, they come back to their their normal reality, but they've they've brought something back also, and that that's part of it too. I think you you kind of have to bring a little piece of the normal reality into the crazy, and a little bit of the crazy back into the normal. And that's uh, as you're, we're all saying. I think the, the the ultimate goal of the creative person is is to find that balance. And uh, when, that, when I look at your brain scan studies, something very fascinating happens. The area that we normally associate with consciousness in the frontal lobe mm. becomes even more active, super active. And so as I would say that we're actually entering a higher or an, you know, an extreme state of consciousness, but you're staying so completely relaxed that you're not carried into the craziness, and that's where the brilliant insights that come up with that you come up with when you're in deep meditation or prayer. Yeah, and the you know so much of what's been um, sort of documented and put out there, and, and I'm not undermining it's remarkable, is some of the abilities like uh, to slow uh, heart rate or to raise body temperature. There, there's been those things have been noted, but sure. I think some of the creative processes have been less emphasized. And and, and, and it, I get it, it's less sensational. Like wow, this person can you know these Tibetans can go out in the snow and you know half naked and, and meditate and be just fine. They don't freeze. They raise their body temperature. Or this you know this Swami. Can can lower his heart rate and and do remarkable things go without food and water for long stretches of time that would be impossible under other circumstances but i think this other piece which is less emphasized is where does creative capacity what happens there in these states what happened i'm sorry i, I didn't quite hear that one. well i'm not sure i, I was just saying that the the more the, the more sensational physiological oh, things yeah. Are, are great but what has what i'm asking as a question it's not we can say i don't know it's really legit because i'm not sure it's been really emphasized is what happens to creative capacity in these highly meditative states well the physio the physiological changes aren't nearly as impressive as what takes place in the brain andy's research has shown that different parts of your brain the function changes by as much as 25 percent and the structure of the brain can probably even be permanently changed by as much as 10 percent yeah. so we're using our mind to literally re rechange basic structures and functions in the brain that we never thought was possible. And this, of course, and is more the connections that are so critical for us in terms of our ability to be creative. Yes. See, that's what I'm saying is that is that the emphasis is often on things you can measure. This is so subjective. What you know, here we've had, we've spent this entire, you know, last 40 minutes or whatever it's been and no one's ever said what is creativity. Well, that, exactly, that was actually the next words out of my mouth, which is you know how how one defines creativity. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm defining it as insanity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I mean, it has these qualities to it, right? Where well, and, and and people can be creative in different ways. I mean, there's, that's there's right. perhaps a very big difference between a scientist who is creatively trying to resolve a you know a big scientific question versus a a sculptor who is creating a, a, a new piece of sculpture or 
uh, or, or a politician who's trying to be creative in resolving a political issue. Not I mean, possible. Well, <laughs> Not that's, such thing. That's, I but, think that group scored the lowest on any uh, creative. That's right. Get <laughs> George Land out there, the politicians. They'll be at the 2%. But that's but, the... But seriously, I mean, don't that's, vote that's, for us. <laughs> that's one of the things that I think is, is a fundamental issue. It's something, you know, you go back, we were talking about neurotheology as a concept. I mean, one of the, one of the most important principles, I think, of neurotheology that we, we have to start with is how do we define things? How do we define spirituality how do we define religiousness god soul and then you know morality creativity nor- normal you know crazy i mean all of these are, are are fundamental questions that that are not so easy to answer and um and and part of what we take from those definitions is how we begin to look at the questions and um and, and then from there whatever definitions we have at the moment whatever we say this is what creativity is that definition may change over time that's the piece that's the piece that we allow for it to be something today and be something else tomorrow there's a piece you know we had dr jean houston on the show she said something really interesting back i think it was in the 70s she was working with margaret mead who uh the famous psychologist who sent her out to a tribe in africa that she had it was reported this tribe had no neuroses and so she she went out to study them and it's it's, it's, she's she's documented this fairly well but I'll, i'll retell it and they very uh, quickly had some problem with sanitation, and what they did is they they, they, they danced the problem. They they scheduled, they put a bonfire, and they got everyone around. And they danced the problem, and they they talked some about it. But they went back to dancing, and then uh, at, at the end of this, the next morning, they had a solution, and and uh, Gene Houston marveled at the way that they what they did with the information, how they you know, processed it was so foreign. And that was one of her conclusions as to, um, I don't know why, maybe they don't have neuroses. But the, the, the point I'm trying to say is that a lot of the ways that we have, um, you mentioned politics, you know, business as usual, a lot of these capacities that we've relied on, it's worth noting that there may be other capacities that have been undermined and that may in fact be critical going forward so we can really either expand this box or think outside of it or whatever the language is because uh, a lot of things that we're, we're, we've been wired into, to use the neuro, neurochemical piece, ain't, ain't working so well. We right. even put that into our last book, that you can literally dance your way out of everyday consciousness into a trance state and I come love up it. with incredible That's creative it. solutions that are actually useful if you come back to everyday consciousness and think it through with the group. Beautiful. And with that, unfortunately, we are uh, going to have to say goodbye, Andrew. I'm so thrilled that I got a chance to meet you. Of course, I've been hanging out with Mark and, and heard about you and have read the, uh, the books, and, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to have you here on this show today. Thanks um, for coming. Thank you very much, and anytime, we'd love to have, engage in more conversations about all this stuff. It's great, great fun. Yeah, and before we let you go, I would love for folks to know where to get to you. So please, if you don't mind, can you give us a website or how people can get uh, more of what you do? Uh, sure. Uh, probably the, the best way, I, I do have my own website, and it's just www.andrewnewberg, and that's N-E-W-B-E-R-G dot com. Excellent. Thanks again for joining us, and uh, we look forward to having you back on. For those of you who are listening, stay tuned, because we'll be right back here on Cutting Edge Consciousness.